Hello, my name is TJ Williams, and I'll be talking about regulation on performance-enhancing drugs, also known as PEDs, in esports. PEDs have been known as a problem in esports ever since 2015, when a pro esports player named Semphis stated in an interview that he, him, and his teammates and other people in the field were using Adderall, a performance-enhancing drug, for esports. The esports industry obviously obviously saw the, saw the problems in this, that being, one, the perpetuation of unsportsman, unsportsmanship-like behavior, and also the detrimental effects to the esports players by using these, by using these performance-enhancing drugs. Those detrimental effects being such as stunted, stunted growth, which is very, very much a serious issue in this, since most esports players are between 18 and 25 years old, and as well as the problem of addiction. Since then, the SIC, or Esports Integrity Coalition, introduced policy in order to regulate this. They first, ag they first advocated for teams to self-regulate, as well as giving more education on the topic, as well as drug testing. However, ever st however the problem still persists with a pro esports player named Killa stating, witnessed, that being performance enhancing drugs, yeah, very frequently, and a lot to be honest, it's a major problem. And he actually cited it as one of the reasons he's l he left. This can also be attributed to the fact that there are many corporate players, such as energy drink companies, Red Bull, G Fuel, etc., that also want to keep that also don't want to go down the slippery slope of regulation since they sell something very similar that being caffeine to many of the performance enhancing drugs that ESIC regulates the advocating policies of ESIC the advocating policies of ESIC as i stated before consist of self-regulation and education. However, I would like to add that this does not get behind the actual motives of eSport players in taking performance enhancing drugs, as according to the Journal of Beha Behavioral Addictions, or poll study by them, of for about 4,000 gamers, 41.4% of them, 41.4% of them that said, that f said they took drugs for game-related reasons 53% of them said it was for tension management, insomnia, avoiding sleep, and to avoid hunger. Problems directly caused, according to this American Osteopathic Association, directly caused by excessive hours in, gamings, in gaming during esport practice, that being circadian rhythm dysregulation, which can make them avoid sleep and insomnia and take pills in order to continue their performance. It can also be due to the fact that uh, metabolic, dysregu metabolic dysregulation, which can allow them to avoid eating and then take pills to get better at that. And also, tension, pain, tension, neck, tension management uh, for neck, back, and wrist pain is also a prevalent issue in esports that would make them more likely to take performance enhancing drugs to better their competitiveness. This can also be, it can also fall short in other aspects. For example, according to a college esport, in, in, the, in the research study of taking college esports seriously, a college e esport player stated that it's not like you're with these guys for the next 30 weeks. You're living with these people, so no, you're not going to cuss them out. If you were an esport player, if you were a teammate on an esport team, and you were asked to self-regulate your team, would you be willing to cuss some, well, would you be willing to, uh, to snitch on one of your teammates and maybe accidentally get cussed out, cussed out at because of how tightly knit, tight, closely knit your uh, relationship is with them? This also, also doesn't get behind the fact that, well, it can, they can all, the team can also lose competitiveness if, if the team, the team member is is found out to have used performance enhancing drugs and it can be banned from several different competitions. 
So I propose, or one solution for this would be to follow what Say No to Drugs campaign had had learned. What we can learn, we should look to the Say No to Drugs campaign for schools to see how we can learn from this. That being to have more interpersonal practice for eSport players, to also get rid of misconceptions or normalities, such as if people think that drugs are pr more prevalent, they're less likely to do something about it. Not, and then there's also the extended length educated, which the SIC policy has actually, uh, actually tended to, but they have not tended to the other stuff. Then there's their drug testing policy. Tests, on average, can cost five to ten thousand dollars per event. This is a big bill for many different esports tournaments and teams. That many that can discriminate between lower level and higher level tournaments. In 2020, if you're if we're taking a level estimate of five thousand dollars per test, that would be five hundred ninety thousand dollars that they would have to spend annually on events. And this is only including higher level tournaments. This money could be better used for health prevention measures. As I mentioned before, a big problem or big motive to taking performance enhancing drugs is due to health problems. And instead of funneling into drug prevention, which can discriminate between levels, we can further it through different programs to prevent or to help prevention of disease and health in health. Right. ESIC policy change. First, we go back over to the Say No to Drugs campaign. The Say No to Drugs campaign, to be able to better translate that over into ESIC or esports competition overall, we can first hold preliminary event, events uh, uh, funded by ESIC policy changes. Now, there is a limitation to funding, but as I said before, drug testing has a lot of money already going into it. They could better go into this as well. This, hopefully, will lengthen the time educated, give more interpersonal practice, and have better education standards that can really teach, teach esports players to, to better regulate themselves. As well as this, uh, drug testing policy, using all the drug testing money more into funneling into lower level esports teams who may not have the, the money to buy exercise equipment, but also to then promote exercise by first having certain requirements for, for esport teams to participate in events so that no team actually loses competitiveness and can better, and can make sure that everyone doesn't take, take their job over their health. Hopefully by the end of this, it'll be It'll have more friend. Be, the environment will be more friendly, less coercive, and the environment will have less. And esport players will have less self-destructive tendencies. However, one limitation probably would be that the corporate sponsors obviously will not be directly affected by this. However, I would argue that this they would be indirectly affected by this, since once esport players are given the autonomy to better regulate themselves. They can choose the sponsorships they want and not actually go towards energy drink companies and maybe go towards more healthy, healthy alternatives. TJ, a couple of questions for you. First question, how did your research question evolve as you moved through the research process? And did your research go in a different way than you had originally planned? Uh, yes. At the start, I actually kind of wanted to do something about the endorphin hypothesis, which is something to do with, well, it, it was about um, the, the um, effects of exercising in sports, but that didn't seem to have many different sides to it. And so I went on to the backup question that I had, which was about should esports be a sport? And while well, that's a great question, and I, there's a lot of discourse on it, I kind of want it to be more focused on the scientific aspects 
and I ended up here. It was a good progression. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then lastly, what additional questions emerge? Like, so you talked about how you started with one thing and then those questions sort of led you to another. So as you leave it, what questions do you still have and why are those questions important? I think to understand to what extent the um, corporate players have in it, I touched on it a bit, but there is a lot probably underground that I, do, I don't know about, and there's a lot that should be known about these corporate players to better regulate ESIC, the esports industry uh, and to also better esports, esports players' lives and those who watch it.